The title of the sermon this morning is Comfort in Affliction. Comfort in Affliction. Whenever we go through trials, we have two options. We can either be shaken or not be shaken by the trials. To be shaken by trials is to get angry with God and to turn away from Him. It's to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. It's to try to cover the pain with sin. It's to maybe self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. To be shaken is to try to, to solve the problem with sin or to go outside of God's will to try to meet your own needs. To be shaken is to panic with fear and worry and anxiety. To be shaken is to lose your faith in God altogether. To be shaken is to seek revenge on, on those that have brought the trouble into your life. And to be shaken is to get angry and bitter and take it out on the people around you. To be shaken is to get depressed, maybe even to end your life. And we all have been through times in our lives where we've been shaken by affliction. And we all know people that have gotten shaken by affliction. The Bible says we don't have to be shaken. As Christians, we can be victors rather than victims. As Christians, our problems don't have to make us bitter. They can make us better. And the Bible gives us all the tools, all the resources that we need to learn how to not be shaken. That's what this whole sermon series is about. And one of the best places to turn in the Bible to learn how to not be shaken by affliction is in our passage this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Probably throughout this sermon series, the past few weeks in your home groups, as you've been talking about trials and tribulations, this passage has probably come up in your mind as you've been talking about things. So we're going to actually look at it in depth this morning. For, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Let me start off by just reading this passage to you. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so also you will share in the comfort. This is the ultimate passage in the Bible on comfort. And so we're going to look into it this morning in depth. There are four realities about comfort in affliction. Four realities about comfort in affliction. Number one, the source of comfort. The source of comfort. Who's the source of comfort? It says in verse 3, Blessed, that's right, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The source of comfort is the God and Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now Paul reveals three aspects of God's nature in that verse. Three aspects of God's nature that prove his willingness to comfort us in times of affliction. So when you go through times of affliction, how do we know? How can we be sure that God wants to comfort us? How do we know? Well, because of who God is. Paul tells us right here. First of all, he says that he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's Paul getting at with that phrase? What he's saying is that he's the one who sent Jesus to save us. God the father is the one who sent Jesus to save us. And if he was willing to do that for us, then he's willing to comfort us in our affliction. He's willing to help us come alongside us in our time of need. Romans 5.8 says, but God proves, how do we know God loves us? How do we know he's willing to comfort us? He proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Paul means, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If God was willing to send Jesus, he's willing to comfort you. The second thing Paul reveals about God's nature is he is the father of mercies. This is a beautiful verse about the nature of God. The, the father of mercies. The word father means that he is the source of, of all mercy. He's the originator. He's the inventor of mercy. He is the best at showing mercy. It also means that, God, that mercy is God's nature. He is merciful. Mercy is what God likes to do. It's what he's inclined to do. It's what he wants to do. God is not just withholding mercy unnecessarily and 
and withholding affection and withholding resources that we need. He wants to show mercy. He wants to pour out love and mercy on us. Luke 1.50 says, His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear Him. But then also notice the word mercies. He is the Father of mercies. Why the plural? Why doesn't it say He's the Father of mercy? Well, God isn't just merciful to us one time in our lives. He's merciful to us constantly. And he isn't just merciful to us in one way through the cross. He's merciful to us in infinite ways. He's the father of mercies. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23 says, For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Now, what is mercy? It says he's the father of mercy. That's a huge concept in the Bible, mercy. One of these mega themes in Scripture. Mercy, here's a definition for you, is the compassion and relief which is administered to those who are in misery. It's the compassion and relief which is administered to those who are in misery. God is the father of mercies. So the object of mercy, the person is, who is receiving mercy is the person who is experiencing sorrow and suffering. And then the act of mercy, of showing mercy, is to feel sorry for that person and to seek to relieve their pain. So God is the father of mercies. God, whenever we go through hard times, God, he knows it because he's God, and he feels sorry for you. He, he, he hates that you're suffering, and he seeks to relieve it. He's the father of mercies. And then... A third aspect of God's nature is he is the God of all comfort. How do we know that God is willing and ready to comfort us? Because he is the God of all comfort. Notice the word all. All true comfort comes from God. Now you can seek comfort in many different ways. Comfort food, and you can seek comfort in and other sinful pleasures, but that's not true comfort. That, not, that kind of comfort is not truly going to help you. God is the source of all true comfort. What is comfort, by the way? That, that word comfort. As I said, this is the definitive passage on comfort in the Bible. The word comfort is used ten times in this passage, in verses three through seven. Ten times. That word comfort it means to come alongside someone to give them strength and courage so that they can cope with their affliction. Comfort, it means to come alongside someone to give them strength and courage so that they can cope with their affliction. So because of who God is, that's why Paul begins with this, because of who God is, we can be confident that he's willing to comfort us and Paul begins this verse with the words, Blessed be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And that's an interesting phrase, blessed be, you'll see that. And what it means, it's, it's, a, it's Paul praising the Lord. Essentially what it means is praise the Lord. You've probably heard uh, Matt Redman's song, Blessed be the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. It's just another word of saying praise the Lord. It's a word that means, that expresses worship and adoration and thanksgiving. Blessed be the Lord. So that's what Paul is, because he's, he's the father of, Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the father of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. Blessed be the Lord. Okay, so that's the first thing. Number two, here's the second reality about comfort, is the promise of comfort. This verse has a promise of comfort. It says in verse 4, this is wonderful. It says, he comforts us in all our affliction. He comforts us in all our affliction. God promises to comfort us. I want you to notice five things about this promise. First of all, this is a promise that can be trusted. Who com comforts us? He. He comforts us. This is a promise, and what do we know about God? God is faithful. He always keeps his word. He always keeps his promises. And so if the Bible says, God is the author of the Bible, if the Bible says God is going to comfort you, you can, you can rest assured, you can bank on it, he's going to comfort you. Joshua 23, 14. It says, I am now going the way of the whole earth, 
And you know with all your heart and all your soul that none of the good promises the Lord your God made to you has failed. Everything was fulfilled for you. Not one promise has failed. God promises to comfort you, and his promises never fail. A second thing I want you to notice about these promises, or this promise, is it's a promise not to remove us from affliction, but to comfort us in affliction. Not to remove us from affliction, but to comfort us in affliction. We saw that from the story of Paul last Sunday as we were talking about Paul and the thorn in his flesh. That Paul said, God, would you take away this thorn? And God said, no, not right now. I'm going to leave it for a while. So God doesn't always promise to remove us from the affliction or to remove the affliction from us, but he does promise to always comfort us in the affliction so that we can endure it. Now, how is God's comfort applied? What does it mean when it says God comforts us? How does he do that? Well, first of all, he does it through the Holy Spirit. He does it through the Holy Spirit. Did you know that in the Bible, Jesus called the Holy Spirit the comforter? The same Greek word that we're finding in this passage 10 times. That's what Jesus called the Holy Spirit, the comforter. Look what it says in John 14, 16. It says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now, I use that King James Version because it uses the word comforter. The Greek word is paraclete. And uh, to comfort is parakaleo. It's all the same word. And the reason why I use the King James Version is because it uses the word comfort. But that word paraclete can be translated in many different words. Uh, comforter, advisor, helper, counselor, advocate. All those things are what the Holy Spirit does for us. But one of those things is the comforter. So the moment you become a Christian, God puts the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And the Holy Spirit is the comforter. So what do you think the Holy Spirit is going to be doing inside of us? He's there to comfort us in our times of affliction. So that's one of the main ways that God comforts us is through the Holy Spirit. But what does the Holy Spirit do exactly? What does it mean that he comforts us? Well, he gives us joy and peace. He assures us that we're God's children and that God has saved us. The Holy Spirit reminds us of God's promises to care for us. The Holy Spirit reminds us that we have heaven to look forward to. Even though you have this difficult trial to face, it's only temporary because you're going to spend eternity in paradise. So the Holy Spirit comforts us. All right, a third thing that I want to point out about this promise is that it's a promise we can claim. It's a promise we can claim. Notice that it says in verse 4, He comforts us in all our affliction. This promise is for you. This promise is not just for some Christians. It wasn't just for the, the original audience that Paul wrote to. And it wasn't just for Paul the Apostle. It's for us. All Christians. He comforts us in all of our affliction. A fourth thing about this promise is that it's a great prom promise. I love the word all. It says he comforts us in all our affliction. Isn't that wonderful? All of our affliction. Now, let me define a couple of words for you here. The word affliction, that's a powerful word. The word affliction can be translated trouble, tribulation, trials, oppression. One author said it means the distress caused by painful pressure. Another commentator says it refers to crushing pressure. One commentator says the word tribulation or, or affliction it means to be weighed down exceedingly, to be pressed and crushed. It's the picture of a beast of burden being crushed beneath a load that is just too heavy. It's the picture of a person having a heavy weight placed on his breast and being pressed and crushed to the point that he feels he's going to die. That's what that word affliction means. And it says God comforts us in all of our afflictions. I love that word all because it means all kinds of afflictions, no matter what your affliction is, might have been persecution, but for you it could be physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, relational, doesn't matter what kind of affliction you're going through, God comforts us in all kinds of afflictions, and that word also, all also means every. You'll never go through an affliction where God is not there to comfort you, doesn't matter what it is. And then one more thing about this promise. It's a proportionate promise. 
This promise to comfort us is a proportionate promise. And this is kind of interesting. It comes from verse 5, where it says, For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. So first of all, it says it talks about the sufferings of Christ. What are the sufferings of Christ? Well, the sufferings of Christ are all the sufferings that Christ endured. It's not just talking about the cross. It's all the sufferings that Christ endured. So what did Christ endure? Well, he was a human being. One commentator listed some of the ways that Christ suffered. He was born to an unwed mother in a stable to poor parents. He was hunted down as a baby, raised in a despicable place, Nazareth. He had no home. He was hated and opposed, charged with insanity and demon possession, rejected by most, betrayed by a close friend, forsaken by all his friends, falsely accused, tortured and executed as an innocent man. He suffered. If anybody understands suffering and affliction of all different kinds, it's Jesus. And so what this verse is saying is that as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so as we suffer in the same way Jesus suffered, it says, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. And what that means is that the comfort that God gives you is in proportion to your suffering. So if you suffer a little, God will give you just enough comfort. If you suffer a lot, if it's intense, if it's horrible, if it's unspeakable, God will meet you with the proportionate comfort that you need. You know, I don't know if you've ever taken uh, some pain medication and the pain medication just didn't work. Like, you're like, I still feel the pain. Or if you've taken some pain medication and it, it helped a little bit, but you still feel a lot of pain, that's not how God's comfort works. God's comfort is completely and perfectly proportionate to whatever we face. In other words, your suffering will never be greater than God's comfort. Okay? So that's the promise of comfort. Let's go to number three. The third reality about comfort in affliction is the purpose of comfort. This passage gives us an interesting purpose for comfort, for God's comfort. It says in verse four, it says, He comforts us in all our affliction. Why? so that we may, able, may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So God comforts us so that he can work through us to comfort other people. Isn't that amazing? So first of all, this passage is reemphasizing for us the reality that your pain is never meaningless. It's never pointless. God has a plan. God has a purpose for your suffering. Last week, we talked about a couple of those reasons. Sometimes God uses pain to grow us. Sometimes God uses pain to protect us from something even worse. But in this passage, God says, sometimes he uses pain in order to equip us for service, to equip us for ministry, to make you a better servant of God. Suffering trains you to comfort others who also suffer. So God uses your divorce to train you to comfort other divorcees. God uses your addiction to train you to comfort addicts. God uses your incarceration to train you to comfort the incarcerated. God uses your loneliness to train you to comfort the lonely. So one of the things that we can take from this is that this means that one of the ways that God comforts us is not just through the Holy Spirit. God comforts us through people, through his servants, through comforters. And so there are really two blessings that we get whenever we go through suffering. First of all, whenever we suffer, we get the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comforts us. But also, whenever other people suffer, God gives us the blessing of being involved in ministry. It's one of the most fulfilling things in life is, is helping another person in a meaningful way. And God will do that with you. He'll use you if you make yourself available. If you'll look for those opportunities, he'll use you to bring comfort to other people. But there's two kind of applications I wanted to point out from this, this verse, this point, the purpose of comfort. God wants to, to use your sufferings to equip you for service and, and how he comforts us through people. The first thing is to find God's comfort 
Like if, if you want to be comforted, if you want the comfort that God has to give you, then one of the things you have to do is surround yourself with God's comforters. Surround yourself with God's people. You have to put yourself in a position to be comforted or you're not going to experience the full measure of God's comfort for you. So you, let's say you're going through a difficult time. God loves you. He wants to come alongside you and to comfort you and give you strength and courage to endure what you're going through. But what he needs you to do is to put yourself in a position to receive his comfort. Because how does he comfort us? Through other believers. You've got to surround yourself with other believers. This is why we emphasize home group at Church Acadiana. Getting involved in a small group. And, and I realize it's not possible for everybody because of your schedule. So it's not a condemnation thing if you can't be a part of home group. But the reason why it's so important is so you can receive the comfort that God wants to give you. So when you go to home group, you're involved in other people's lives, and they're involved in your life, and you're doing life together. You're praying for each other every week. You're fellowshipping with one another. And so you've got this group of Christians surrounding you so that whenever you go through that hard time, when you go through affliction, they are ready to come alongside you and give you the comfort that God wants to give you. You've got to put yourself in position. But also, I want to encourage you as a church family to look for those opportunities to comfort others, especially in our church family, in your own family, friends, but especially in our church. Because remember, one of the ways that God comforts us, the main, one of the main ways is through other believers. So when we see somebody in our church who's going through a difficult time, what's God's plan? God wants to comfort them. He is the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. He wants to comfort them, and he has a plan to comfort them, and that plan is you, and it's me. And it's our church family. So we've got to surround those in our church who are suffering. Let's love on them. Let God love on them through us. Okay? And here's number four. The fourth and final reality about the comfort of God in affliction is the key to comfort. The key to comfort. And this is found in verse 6. It says, If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. Now that last phrase, the last part of that verse is what I want you to focus on for a minute. It says, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. Now that can be translated in two ways. And you'll see it in two different, two different ways in different Bible versions, whatever Bible translation you use. But the first way that that can be translated is that the comfort, Paul was talking to the Corinthians, the, the comfort that they received from Paul would help them to endure suffering. And that's the way the Christian Standard Bible, which I use to preach from, that's the way it translates it. The comfort that we receive from others helps us to endure suffering. Now that's true. That makes sense. The comfort from we receive from others helps us to, uh, to endure. But other Bible versions, like the English Standard Version, word it this way. And I think this is also true. Yeah, look at this, the English Standard Version. Look how it translates this last part. It says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So according to this translation, what this last phrase means is that the key to receiving God's comfort is endurance. If you want the full measure of God's comfort, we already talked about one thing you've got to do. You've got to put yourself in position. You've got you to get close with church family so that they're surrounding you and they're ready to love on you when you go through hard times. But this tells us another thing we have to do to receive the full measure of God's comfort. Endurance. You have to endure. Now, the Greek word, we talked about this in our home group this week, matter of fact. It came up in conversation. The Greek word for endurance. This is one of my favorite words in the Bible. It's made up of two words. One Greek word means to remain, and the other Greek word is under. If you're curious, the Greek word is hupameno. Hupameno. So hupa, remain, meno, under. To remain under. So endurance... The idea is to remain under pressure. Or as a Christian, it means to remain Christ-like under pressure. 
to remain Christ-like in the midst of your suffering. That's what endurance is. So, to endure means that whenever you go through affliction, you run to God for comfort rather than running away from Him in anger and doubt. To endure, it means that you run to God for comfort rather than relying upon sinful pleasures. To endure means that you wait on God's provision instead of trying to meet your own needs by going outside of God's will. To endure means that you remain faithful under pressure. Now this verse is saying that if you want the full measure of God's comfort, do not give up on God. It's saying endure in trials. So one of the things that's interesting I found as I studied this word endurance is that you guys have heard of the Septuagint. We've talked about the Septuagint before. Some of the scholars, around the time that Jesus was alive, some of the Hebrew scholars, the Jewish scholars, they took the Hebrew Old Testament and they translated it into Greek because everybody was speaking Greek at that time. Greek was the English of that day. And so they translated the Old Testament into Greek. And if you remember, in the Old Testament, especially in the wisdom literature, like the book of Psalms, it's always giving us this, this command and this encouragement, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. So when these Hebrew scholars, they translated the Old Testament into Greek, and they came to this Hebrew word, wait, what Greek word did they use to translate that wait? Hupameno. Endure. To endure is to wait on the Lord. In other words, you're going through difficult times. Let's say you're, you're married. We're going to talk about marriage in a, in a few weeks. It's actually, starting next week, we're going to do a marriage sermon series. Haven't done one in a long time. But let's say you're married and, and your spouse is not meeting your needs. That's affliction. That can be afflicting. And so you're tempted at that point to go outside the marriage bed to meet your own needs. To endure is to wait on the Lord to stay faithful in those times of affliction. And the Bible says if you want God's comfort in your affliction, you got to wait. Don't run to sin. Don't go outside God's will. Wait. Stay in that place. That's where it takes faith. That's why it's called endurance. Like an endurance race. It's hard. Stay in that place. Wait for God's comfort. And here's, here's the, the negative side of that is a lot of times we don't experience God's comfort because we don't wait. We're not enduring. Because as soon as we go through hard times, we run away from God, we run to sin to meet our own needs. And so we miss out on the supernatural, true comfort that can only come from God. Because he is not going to comfort us if we're comforting ourselves with sin. And so what this translation is saying is that if you want God's comfort, you have to patiently endure suffering. Jesus is the best example of, of endurance. Look at the passage on the screen, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So if we want to learn about endurance, this is what the Bible tells us. If we want to learn how to wait under the Lord, on the Lord and to, to stay faithful in affliction. It says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us let us run with what? Hupameno, with endurance, the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. So it's saying if you want to learn about endurance and stay encouraged about endurance and, and stay motivated to endure, remember the example of Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He endured the cross. What does that mean? Well, he didn't run from the cross. And when he was in the cross, he didn't seek self-medication. And, and, uh, uh, and when he was in the cross, he didn't sin. When he was on the cross, he didn't seek revenge. 
When he was on the cross, he didn't turn away from God. He endured the cross. That's what we have to do if we want the full measure of God's comfort in affliction. So this passage tells us you never have to go through problems alone. The Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, He wants to comfort you. He loves you. He wants to come alongside of you no matter what you're facing. All of our afflictions, He wants to comfort you. And He uses us then to comfort others, to help them endure. You want to endure? You say, man, I need the strength to endure. Where do we get the strength to endure? It's through the comfort we receive from God through other people. Isn't that wonderful? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this word. And and God, I, I pray right now that you would help us, Father, to seek comfort in you, the God of all comfort, to trust in that, Lord, that you truly have the comfort that we need. We don't need to go elsewhere. We don't need to go outside of your will. We don't need to provide for our own needs. You've got all we need. We just need to endure. We need to wait for you, Lord. Give us the faith to do that. Lord, I pray that as a church family, God, that you would help us to truly love on each other in times of affliction, to truly comfort one another, and to look out for those opportunities to serve God and not to get too busy and too self-centered to help each other out. Lord, we pray right now for those in our church who are going through difficult times, times of affliction right now. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort them, love on them, show them your mercy, help them to endure, help them to seek comfort through other believers. We pray, Lord, that through the pain that we're all experiencing, that they're experiencing, that you would work it out for their good and that you would get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.